Hi, I'm Gina Millsap, the Chief Executive Officer of the Topeka and Shawnee County Library, and it's my pleasure today to welcome uh, uh, one of my predecessors, uh, James Marvin, who was Director of the Topeka Library from Jim. Give me the dates. 1967 to 192. 25 years. Um, and Jim and I were just discussing. Excuse me, 22. I backed it up 100th century. Years. I may look at it, <laughs> it mustn't be that. <laughs> you look fabulous. Yeah. Uh, and Jim and I were just discussing the fact that there's about 40 years between the time that he started at yeah. the library and that I began my tenure in 2005. So we're just going to have a fun conversation mm -hmm. today about um, how things have changed, but also how things uh, remain the same, mm -hmm. and which is that this has always been an incredible library mm -hmm. serving its community. Mm -hmm. So I want to start out, Jim, by asking you, um, how did you find your way to Kansas? Because you're not a native Kansan. No, not hardly. <clears throat> My home is on the Canadian border of Minnesota on the seventh largest lake in the United States. Only the Great Lakes and the Great Salt Lake are larger. And it's a confusing place to live because it's part Canada and part United States. It's part Manitoba and part Ontario and part Minnesota. It's dazzling for fishermen to go out on that lake because it's hard to see the dotted lines on that water. You know, am I in this province? Am I in that? What country am I in? Is it legal <laughs> to be here and so forth? So uh, that was my home, a long one, 800 miles actually north of Topeka. So, uh, and in traveling around the country and working in different places, it happens that I never drove through Kansas or had never been here. So when I got that call, it was kind of tempting, you know, like Shangri-La, you know. Maybe there's really something at <laughs> that's the how end we of this think call. Of it, yeah. <laughs> you never thought of it as Shangri-La? No, no, I, I, that's, that's how I was being a bit ironic. Really? <laughs> <I know. Yeah. laughs> well, anyway, that, that's how I got here, interviewing. I was restless. I had been a Rockefeller Foundation of Library Science at the University of the Philippines for 14 months, and my family and I were restless. We had traveled around the world, not many families get a chance to do that. And uh, Iowa is nice, the corn is great, but I just wanted to change. And maybe, uh, maybe Kansas was an unusual change, but it turned out to be a good one. When my wife and I were here and the, the members of the library board and the people we met were charming and sincere and honest. And uh, I told her near the end of the time, I said, I'm getting to like this. She said, I am too. So I, had, I knew before the offer came what the answer was going to be, if I got the offer. And that's how I got here. I'm wondering how you did. Uh, I applied for the job. And actually, interestingly enough, I was not the first choice. Mm -hmm. uh, it was offered to someone mm -hmm. else first. And ultimately, he decided not to take the position. Mm -hmm. But as I said to the board chair at the time, I said, um, I can live with being the second choice. Mm -hmm. Um, if we all agree that you just made a mistake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the difference in your incredible youth and my age is that uh, I never applied for a library job. At that time, uh, it was kind of hard to get administrators of any, that were lively in any experience. You know, so uh -huh. the time was different. The, the number of graduate library schools was far less than it got to be. And uh, so people were kind of pursuing, I don't mean me as I was a hot pursuit, but the, the job feeling was different then and you kind of had to go looking for what you wanted. And you, correct me if I'm wrong, but you didn't really work your way up in libraries, right? Not exactly. Right. Like not at all. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid that you probably know <laughs> that, that the first library I ran was the first public library I'd ever been in. Right. There was no public library in my little hometown. There is now a wonderful library that my cousin gave to the community. And it's really a charming and nice library. <clears throat> then, uh, so when I went to the University of Minnesota, uh, people didn't generally use the, let's say, the, the central city public library. I don't want to name it. But it was really horrible at that time. It was great now. It was terrible then. So uh, the library that I used was the library where I went to school. And so when I got my first job offer for a little library of 10,000 community in, in eastern Wisconsin, uh, I'd never been in a public library before. 
So I was learning a lot while trying to get a job. As a, a, we, my wife and I had two children, and there was hit of a third. <laughs> I had to have work. And the, anyway, it worked out. So uh, what did you learn by the time that you came to Topeka? and became the director of the Topeka Library. What did you know, what did you think about public libraries? What, what did you think they should be doing <clears> in their <throat> communities? You know, one thing, I, uh, I didn't learn them from any early experience, learn about them from any early experience for certain. But I did find an excitement in, in libraries, an excitement in the, in the variety, even that first town of mostly Dutch settlers in eastern Wisconsin, near Green Bay. Uh, the interesting people that use libraries, mm -hmm. the kinds of things you could use as bait to get them in and hold them, and, and the way you got in, the way you met a community as head of a library, and the organizations you got to go to, and the, and the clubs, heavily women's clubs that needed speakers all the time, and the, you got to know those people. And the, at that time, and probably today, women had to work harder to make their communities go than men did. And uh, <clears throat> the women were outstanding on library boards in the communities, and there was that part of it. It was just learning, uh, learning about society in a new way. Well, one of the things that I discovered, um, and, and it's part of your legacy yeah. here, is that when I got here, uh, the, the position of director was perceived as a community leadership mm -hmm. position, and clearly, you know, it, that the library took its yeah. tone from you because you always considered yourself yeah. a community leader, didn't you? Well, I was certainly involved in the community. I'm not sure leader. <clears throat> I hope with leadership was certainly uh, creative followership, if nothing else. I like when that. I was in Cedar Rapids, a community that you're familiar with, I was on 11 boards. That's a lot. It is, a, and you you found that can happen very easily. Yes. And you find that your time is stretched pretty thin between doing the work that you have to do that you're paid for and that community work that you feel a responsibility mm -hmm. to do. And uh, it's kind of a tough balance. It, and then if you is. have a, a growing family, we, we've seen me, we had children every place we lived except here. <laughs> a new child was arriving in Minneapolis and two in, in Wisconsin and Iowa that uh, there's that part of living, as you know, you've got to look after your family as well as... Uh, you do. There is that balance yeah. there. So one of the things that struck me when I came here was that uh, the library had just exceptional outreach services, that uh, it, this, this was a library that the staff just didn't stay in the building. Mm -hmm. You know, a, and a, a lot of the work actually occurred out in the community. Yeah. And I know a lot of that came under your leadership. Can you talk a little bit about red carpet services and how all of that evolved? Uh, <clears throat> uh, could, you, could you tighten that question up a little bit? I want to be sure I'm not all over the place trying to answer it. It's kind of the innovative services that started under your leadership, and one of them was red carpet. Yeah. So, and I know that there, there's a story there yeah. about how red carpet got started, and I thought it had to do with, um, it first started with volunteers, did it yeah. not? Well, <clears throat> do you know that uh, I keep, when I think of red carpet, I think of its, its founding mother, Jean Tevis, who I think is still working in the community. And she happened to be a staff member who had an enormity of ideas about what you could do and what was needed, and, and not self-serving in any way. She wanted not to grow an empire, but to be out where people needed her. And I think she saw, uh, she saw this need uh, <clears throat> among the elderly for services. It's hard for them to get out. Services uh, that were cut largely unmet. And I just have to say that if there was any triumph for me, it was helping her and encouraging her to get going and building. And I think uh, <clears throat> if I had any successes at all along the way, uh, I'd have to attribute that to my skill in identifying powerful people that could get those things done, and you know that you're, it's your staff that you're just over, you need overwhelmingly, you know, a good staff. And I think if you help build that staff and encourage their participation, uh, you've come a long way. But I don't know if you've done it yourself or if you've done it through them or both. 
Well, I always say, because I consider you, even though we never actually worked together, I do yeah. consider you a mentor yeah. because of the legacy that you left. And you remind me very much of my first boss, whose yeah. name was Gene Martin, also mm. started with, so yeah. I called him Mr. M. <laughs> and you're, you're another Mr. M for yeah. me. Um, but, but what I learned from him, but also from you, is that the most important thing is, is your staff, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's through good times and bad. Mm -hmm. So we all go through times when we mm -hmm. have budget cuts. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that I always learned from my Mr. M, and I think you, you practice this as well, is that um, it doesn't matter how great your collections are or how mm -hmm. beautiful your building is or how many other assets you have. If you don't have a great staff, mm -hmm. the library will not be successful. And so that ability, I always say, um, I can't claim credit for all the wonderful work that goes on here. But what I do claim credit for is, is recognizing wonderful talent mm -hmm. and recruiting it to the library. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you did yeah. as well. When, uh, <clears throat> Horace Moses had been the director of this library before I got here. I th he died on the job, I think, 1964. And it seems to me that he was, or 65 maybe, he was flying to London on book acquisition. That's a different, he was a scholarly librarian, and, and that shows you the kind of interest that he had. I think he, he died at the airport. His wife was with him. Oh, but his wife, Mabel, Mabel Moses, became a fixture in this building. She was so stunningly supportive of me and the, and the work the library did that I could never, ever thank her enough. I remember the day meeting in our office, which was uh, many remodelings ago <laughs> and downstairs and long gone. I remember her saying, you know, she said, uh, we were meeting with the friends of the library board, she said, I think we ought to have a book sale. Well, people call, well, maybe, you know, the, the Mulvane Women's Board has a book sale every spring at the event at Washburn, and uh, would we be competing? She said, no, she said, I'm thinking of a different level of book sale than a card table of books. And the book sale in Topeka really has become something. I think mm -hmm. it's important to people. People flock in to use it. You're having it now on a staggered basis. You had it outside right. a few weeks ago. And, but I think if there was anything that can be attributed to a single person, it is to that friend of the library and widow of the previous library director uh, who, who I'd give all the credit for. She was so helpful. And, and people came forward as they are now mm -hmm. to help. They're excited about the library. They wanted to help. And I think you, you got to tap into that wonderful, rich community, richness of help and ideas, as well as your staff. You know, work them all together. A good board that helps you, that doesn't bug you, but helps you <laughs> and, and right. helps you move forward and solve problems. That's all important. Uh, well, it, it is, and I, I think that, again, yeah. starting with, with probably yeah, Mr. Moses uh -huh, as well, yeah. but, um, and certainly his predecessors, but there's a, a real tradition here of involving community and yeah. listening to community as mm -hmm. well, to really pay attention to what is it People want their public library to be. Yeah. Yeah. So, so share with me if you could point to one thing that you are proudest of. That I had what? That you are proudest of. Okay. During your tenure, what would it be? That's tough. I think maybe just helping keep the groundwork going, uh, that the, to keep offering new services to the community, to reach out and try to tap new user groups that you want to be, and to keep the building uh, fresh and responsive, and, the, and to keep the building program going. I think you're working in all directions. I remember one time <clears throat> meeting with a, we didn't have an auditorium there, but meeting with a group of neighborhood mothers in the, uh, in the fine arts division of the library years ago. That's where we mm -hmm. could set up enough chairs. And they were from this neighborhood they knew the library in a different way. They knew it because if they wanted to cool off in the summer, it's the only place you could go that had air conditioning. Right. You know, so the library was used for them in a different way. <clears throat> and they said, well, they said, we'll tell you. And they, to a person said, here's a problem they said we have. They said, our kids are using the books. We don't always get them back on time. The fines pile up. She said, is there anything you can do about fines on children's work. Now it seems just like a little bit of a problem, but, but if you're a parent, 
struggling to make do, and that's just another problem that comes between you and the library you want to use. So I thought about that, and I thought, well, it seems to me that uh, it might be a good idea to give up fines on children's books. And uh, <clears throat> I carried that idea to the library board, and they were a little bit cautious. They said, well, don't you need that funding? And, and you know, that old idea about penalize people to make them behave, and right. a fine is, you associate that with your car overparking and so forth. So uh, we gave it up, and I thought it was a great success. Now, this is, I'm not saying that everybody had to do that, but I'm just saying that it was a response to a neighborhood problem that I thought really worked. And that, well, if it worked that well, let's give it up for adults. Maybe the and if you well, adults can afford blah blah. Uh, I thought it was wonderful not to be fining people. I said they still got a bill mm -hmm. at the end of the, if they didn't return library material, they got a bill, but they didn't have that fine. That's a constant problem when young families trying to make it. In the, so I, I think that idea has come and gone since then, and I'm not advocating it for everybody. Actually, but it's just what you it's could, we no, could do here. No, it's back. Uh, the, and yeah. if, interestingly enough, you know, you and I had a bit of a discussion about the fact that we reinstated fines here uh, during the recession in 2008. Yeah. That, and it really wasn't to, for the money. It was we were not able to buy, we had we cut our book yeah, budget in uh -huh. half, and so we needed to increase the turnover yeah. of the collections. But interestingly enough, a few years after that, we eliminated the fines on children's materials. Yeah. And I didn't realize that you had done that. So uh -huh. again, you led the way on that. Yeah. Um, there is now a very big trend in public libraries nationally to eliminate fines. And you know, for during the pandemic, which mm -hmm. we're in right now, uh, we are not charging fines. Yeah. And we're actually giving unlimited renewals mm -hmm. of materials as well. And so that may be something that we look at again. So it's kind of what goes around comes yeah. around. How much of a barrier are we unintentionally yeah, creating yeah. sometimes, right? Yeah. yeah. And, but it's good to be aware of those things and to yeah. assess them. I suppose there is a side. There's always two sides to an argument. Sometimes yeah. there are more. Well, it, it is that little, the fines weren't outrageously high. And they weren't. I don't think, and it maybe maybe it it helps people be more inclined to to get that material back so it can be used. And I, I can see you have to see both sides of it. I was thinking when uh, when I came here, uh, the if I, I'm not mistaken, I think the library budget was about one fortieth of what it is now. It was Do you around four hundred thousand. It was four hundred thousand dollars. So less than it's half probably a million around dollars. twenty million now. Yes. And there's been uh, inflation, but that's overwhelmingly not inflationary increase. That's a real increase in a community that is using its library heavily. Well, it is. And when we, uh, we became a library district, yeah. uh, it was interesting to me uh, when I came here because um, the library grew, really doubled in size in mm -hmm. terms of staff and services yeah. uh, with the new building. Mm -hmm. um, and it was interesting because when I came here, after two weeks, I could tell you who was, as I used to refer to it, BB, who mm -hmm. was employed here before the building and who came after the building. Mm -hmm. um, there were about uh, a few, less than 100 employees uh, prior to the building of mm -hmm. the new building. And um, it was very much a family, wasn't mm -hmm. it? It was very similar to other libraries mm -hmm. I had worked in. Um, and then after this new building was completed um, with very ambitious service programs, mm -hmm. Um, the more staff were, were hired mm -hmm. to really implement all those services mm -hmm. and programs. Uh, and so, yes, the, the budget increased right along with that, and we've yeah. been very fortunate. Mm -hmm. well, we were, <clears throat> I, don't, I think poverty, uh, it's easy to exaggerate the value of poverty. You know, you know hard work and blah, blah. Uh, and, <clears throat> and I think poverty wasn't good for this library. It's a library that wanted to grow and people wanted to use it. And uh, I don't ever, ever recall a protest uh, regarding our budget, a written or in-person protest. I think you're right here in the community. You're living with these people. You're seeing them every day. Uh, you can't take their money unless you give them something back for it. Right. It's, it's valuable. And I didn't think it, the library was terribly undernourished, and it wasn't anybody's fault. It was the nature of the law at that time. That's the way the law was. There were no legislators out there in Western Canada saying, we want to get you, we don't want you. It wasn't that at all. It simply was old legislation that had a mill levy set on this library, and it couldn't get anywhere. You couldn't 
grow because the, the funding was so terribly inadequate. And as I said, it's grown now and people it probably should be more. There are things you could do, ideas you have germinating there, if you just had a few more dollars. So well, here, I'm all for you. But I, I appreciate the support, but what happened in the interim was that not only did our friends become very successful at, the, at their activities in raising resources yeah. for the library, but the foundation was started. Yeah. And so the combination of those two nonprofits kind of fill that gap, uh -huh. right? And so that continues to this day. Yeah. We're very fortunate. So we've actually been able to keep the, mm -hmm. the tax rate for the library mm -hmm. level for mm -hmm. over a decade. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it will continue on that way for a while yeah. because I think we've become resourceful mm -hmm. at getting other resources mm -hmm. as well. But we have, uh, we have we're very fortunate in that um, we have much better than average uh, funding for a public library mm -hmm. in any community in the United mm -hmm. States. And that really speaks to the support that and we have. And you have a much better, I can say this because I've been out of it a long time, and you have a much better product here than most communities. This is a wonderful library. It's fun to use, it's helpful, uh, it's a growing edge library, and it's a fun, good place. It is. You're, you're, you're giving people everything they're paying for and then some. A wonderful staff. Uh, I think. So uh, congratulations to well, you for that. Thank you. All of you. Again, all of you. Building yeah. building on a, a on a great leg, leg, legacy of service and stewardship yeah. of of any resources that yeah. we've been entrusted mm -hmm. with. So so Jim, let me ask you this. So uh, as you know, I'm I'm getting ready to retire. I'll be here. More's for, the pity. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I've been here for 15 years, and it's been I've enjoyed every day of it, uh, and I felt so fortunate that yeah. this was the place that I landed to finish my career. I, I really feel like we were a good fit for each other. Um, but we're, and I think we're also leaving a wonderful things in place for who comes after mm -hmm. in terms of, of the next CEO. But as you, as you think about what happened during your tenure, what you've seen, how you've seen the library grow, do you have thoughts about what the library should be looking at or becoming, say, over the next decade? <clears throat> well, you know, the, there was always that a little guilt complex about we got this all in one place and book will be mm -hmm. uh, we had a branch system in Cedar Rapids that you I was always haunted by the fact that um, are we taking this way out because it makes sense or because uh, it's easier uh, should should the physical plant of the library be more available. Mm -hmm. And now that the library is countywide and it wasn't when I got here, uh, is that something to think about or or would that be awkward and maybe unnecessary and maybe the way people are mobile today, uh, I carry information on my phone, my any phone, my, I'm Googling all the time. You know, I'm, I'm getting information wherever I am just as people are calling our reference service for that. Uh, I, you know, I, I think that's the only gnawing thing is, Physically, is the library plant as accessible as it should be, even with bookmobiles? Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. I struggled with that at the time and took the way I convinced myself that it wasn't needed. But now here you've got a pretty good-sized county. And may, maybe there are places the library should be in a more permanent way. I don't know. And maybe that's old-fashioned and, and nonsense. I, I think that it's the right question. Yeah. My response is, are branches the right solution? Because as I always say, there's nothing innovative about branches. They, yeah. the, the library at Alexandria probably had extra caves to stash their scrolls in, yeah. right? So, yeah. so there's nothing innovative about replicating libraries throughout a community. I think the question becomes, how do we achieve equity, service yeah. equity, right? Mm -hmm. And so we've, we've tried that in a variety of ways with vehicles, yeah. but we're, we're also co-locating in other locations mm -hmm. now. We have technology labs in all the community centers mm -hmm. and in one of the uh, Topeka Housing Authority neighborhood mm -hmm. uh, community centers. And I think we'll be looking for other opportunities uh, where we actually partner with other organizations mm -hmm. So rather than investing in more bricks and mortar that all have to be maintained, we're still, we're still deploying mm -hmm. throughout the community, but the investment we're making is in services and programs and collections. Mm -hmm. So 
absolutely the right question. Yeah. Then, but what what strategy do you use to satisfy it? I don't know. It? It's always yeah. going to be a gnawing, yeah, GNA, a gnawing right. problem. Just how to do when I uh, make an occasional, maybe two occasional trip up north on Highway 75. It's a long way before mm -hmm. I get to the next county. It is. And all that territory is yours, so to speak, to serve. It's 500 square yeah, miles. I see those beautiful yeah. big bales of hay in the sun. You know, I think it's so beautiful, that, mm -hmm. that, that rural country. And there are people dotted throughout there. A physical facility, I don't see one on my way. I, I mean, of course there isn't one, but I don't see in my mind's eye how that could be handled physically. I think maybe uh, this is the uh, maybe it's best to to watch and wait and participate and talk to people and as you as you're doing and see what would happen. I'm not at all sure that that on those fields uh, a facility is exactly the answer the way that population is distributed. Right. Uh, it's a tough problem. Well, we're we're spread out over 500 square miles, yeah. 178,000 people, yeah. but about 120,000 of those actually live within the city limits. Yeah. And then we have that Shawnee County perimeter yeah. where, as you point out, the yeah. population is a lot less yeah. dense. So uh, there is a bit of a quandary there. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, we're also trying a lot of new, we're experimenting right now during the yeah. pandemic. So we've instituted home delivery because we can't mm -hmm. send our bookmobiles out. So we're delivering to people's mm -hmm. homes right now. I wouldn't want to think uh, the people of Rossville and Silver Lake think I'm demeaning it only way to think of them as branches, but if you thought about this as a library system and, and forgot mm -hmm. about ownership, they do function as branches of a big system of good ones in that area. So when I drive through those towns, there are, there are cars parked in front of the library, so they're busy. And we're good partners. And if I don't know if mm -hmm. you have an involvement with them. We do. We you are. Do. We have very it strong seems partnerships. Seems to me that maybe them. maybe mm -hmm. that's the best way of think. Well, we're we're one system mm -hmm. owned by different people, and uh, and they're functioning parts of it, just as this central building is. Well, I think you've hit on something that's going, that has um, always been important, but we've made a really high priority, yeah. and that is partnerships. Yeah. Um, is uh, that we're not the Lone Ranger, yeah. nor should we mm -hmm. be. Um, and to achieve the biggest impact, mm -hmm. right, for mm -hmm. literacy and learning mm -hmm. and all the great things public libraries do, mm -hmm. we must have partners yeah. that have different areas of talent and yeah. expertise and resources. Yeah. And then you can achieve mm -hmm. great things. Yeah. I think yeah. uh, we don't have any rating of the the best. I think this is one of the best libraries in the country. I really do. I do too. I think because of, of how closely it it measures and listens to its community and what is needed, and the services are are tops, and the library is fresh and clean and fun to come in, and and I just think it's uh, your successor is going to have a heck of a time. One, because you've been so good here. And two, wondering uh, how do I take this success story and move with it mm -hmm. in, in my own way and and my brand. I, that's a tough one because you're not overwhelmed with the needs that maybe existed here years ago when there was no money, a poor facility, the works. I can remember just to say a nod in my predecessor, Horace Moses' <laughs> direction. He died uh, on the job, but I thought, it took a lot of courage at his time to move the library. It was in a, I like railroads and I like railroad stations, it's my age. And the library on the State House grounds, to me in pictures, looked like a two story railroad mm -hmm. building to me. And people like it. I can't say that in a demeaning way because I find people who remember it like that building that was important and we went there as kids, blah, blah. But I think to take that library, off the state house grounds and to move it west out of what was then a teeming downtown that was a courageous step it was it turned out to be a good one but i don't know if i would have made it it was tough and he he did that and it, he got the job done and died and uh, that's that's what he got for what he did <laughs> I just, but i think uh, that took a lot of courage and i think when the Annals are written, and they have been partially. Uh, I think, I think a lot of credit should go to 
the people involved in that risky move. I think it was a tough one to do, don't you? I think it required great courage and leadership. And here's what's interesting about that. Yeah. So in a recent survey that we did, uh, interviews were conducted with yeah. various community leaders. Yeah. And one of the things that they said about this library, that we have such a high level of, tr but we didn't move again. Mm -hmm. So as growth and prosperity kind of move west. Mm -hmm. There w might have been a temptation to move this library even further west. Mm -hmm. We chose not to do that. We chose to stay in the center of the community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that has had enormous yeah. positive consequences because mm -hmm. we're still accessible, I think, to people who are in circumstances mm -hmm. that really need their mm -hmm. library the most. Um, and even people who live further away recognize that we serve a very important mm -hmm. community anchor function mm -hmm. here. So again, you know, the historical decisions that have been made, we are still reaping the benefits mm -hmm. of. Yeah. Instead yeah. of being downtown, which you, <clears throat> and I'm talking that all downtowns have changed, mm -hmm. except maybe Nashville, <laughs> have changed seriously. And they're not exactly night venues, not a exactly where families are always flocking. Let's put it that way. Here's a kind of a humbling location for the library in a big average neighborhood mm -hmm. full of people, residents, who still walk. You see them out in the front porch when you drive here. And then an enormous medical facility which draws an awful lot of people. Mm -hmm. And so it has the draw, people coming to that facility, it has the humbling effect of a neighborhood with simple middle-class homes, it's, it's an interesting kind of neighborhood, I mean, setting that I think you wouldn't find most public libraries in. And I think it's been an opportunity. It has and, been. And you have uh, used that opportunity, yeah. So I have one final question for you, and then you can say you, you're welcome to offer anything you want. But if you were going to be advising the next Topeka and Shawnee County Public Library Chief Executive Officer, what words of wisdom do you have for him? Oh, that's or her? a tough one. I know. You knew it is almost unanswerable. But you can do it. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> well, for one thing, whoever you hire, man or woman, is going to be successful where he or she is. So, for one thing, I'd, I would encourage that person uh, not to be discouraged, one, from the more affluent library in terms of services and also finances that they're reaching, you know, not, 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 to, not to think there isn't work to be done. That there is work to be done. There are people are be, that are unserved. There are people that don't have services they probably need. And I think you just got to keep on uh, pounding away at it. You know, this is the community. The service can be better. Find those places where it's, that are weaknesses. Listen to people. Be in organizations. Listen, you know, when you're on a party or having a drink or a beer or whatever, People do talk about the library. Mm -hmm. They have got ideas about the library. Listen to those ideas. Work with your staff and board. See if you can bring them all together and, and keep the thing going. I, I don't think there's a magic, any bit of magic. It's just that, uh, that you are good where you were, be better where you are. You know what? Think I, lively. I think that's perfect. Do you? That is the perfect yeah. advice. And, I don't know where we are in terms of our timing here, but, but my hat's off to you to come into a good library system and making it exciting and better. Thank you. And that's that you and your staff and boards have, have been superb. And so you can, you can go out to your ranch and buy that horse <laughs> and think, I've done a good job there. I've done the best I can, and I think it worked. It paid off. I never, ever hear a criticism of this library ever, and I mean that. So take that and enjoy it. I will. And enjoy the life you've got coming. Thank it's kind you, of Jane. exciting. It I is. can remember that June 11th, 1992. I shouldn't remember, the, at least I don't remember the time that it was my first day that I was no longer an employee of this library. Now, this is a different kind of morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wish everybody well, but, but it's a nice feeling and you just have to have the courage to enjoy not working. When you've so got a wonderful job, not only it should did you come have more easily to you. Well, not only did you offer really wise words of wisdom for yeah. the next CEO, yeah. but to me as well. So thank you very thank much. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you. It's been a wonderful job, great staff. 
and I am and joy. I, I think, and I feel so lucky to have known you, yeah. uh, and, and that yeah. we've become yeah. friends. Yeah. Well, maybe you'll find that old man of some interest around the community. We'll meet. Maybe you can have coffee for a change. Hey, I'll take you to lunch. Yeah. Good <laughs> idea. <laughs> we've had. It. Enjoy your life. Thank you. You bet. Thank you.